And uh, next we'll have a uh, talk from one of our postdocs, Jared. Jared, do you mind sharing? Okay, we're getting your screen. All right, can everyone hear me? Yep, uh, we can hear you, cool. we can see your screen. Great. All right, hi everyone. I'm Jared Willard. I'm a postdoc at NERSC in the Data and AI Services Group. And today I'm just going to share one of the many exciting AI science applications going on at NERSC, in particular the large-scale transformer-based weather prediction. And this work is done in collaboration with machine learning engineers at NERSC, Peter and Shashank, and also climate scientists in um, the Earth and Environmental Sciences area at Berkeley Lab and UC Berkeley. So in the past five years or so, we've seen a rapid rise in the, in the capabilities of data-driven weather forecasting. And this is due to a number of things, but the top three, I think, are the first being the availability of large, high-quality, open, open source, publicly available meteorological data sets, like, for example, the ERA-5 reanalysis from the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting. And the second, obviously, being um, GPU-powered HPC. And the third being advances in deep learning. So with the advent of transformers into vision transformers into um, you know, very involved graph neural networks, uh, these three have kind of all contributed to this rapid rise. And if we look at a timeline, um, you know, back in 2018, uh, AI weather modeling was kind of limited to representing, you know, the entire planet with just um, like 1.8K pixels when map mapping um, it to a grid. And this has slowly increased over time um, with, in 22, kind of the exciting uh, work done by ForecastNet, which you're probably familiar with since it was developed here, um, scaled eventually to about 1 million pixels. And this was a huge deal, um, forecasting at quarter degree resolution at um, performance nearing operational current um, numerical weather forecasting operational skill. But if we continue this timeline um, and look at you know, how the forecast that started with a, using a combination of a vision transformer with the adaptive Fourier neural operator. Um, there's been a ton of models that have come out in the past few years, and they all kind of have different um, approaches to it, whether that be, you know, using diffusion models, um, you know, these models like GraphCast, GenCast, Neural GCM are from Google, you know, you have Feng Wu from Shanghai, Artificial, Intel Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, uh, Pangu Weather from Huawei and all these groups have kind of their own approach um, with their uh, kind of own innovations. And so when approaching this problem, you kind of face this dilemma of, you know, which model do I choose? Um, which is, which aspects of which model are the most helpful? You know, it's given that these are also recent, you know, they're all still archive papers. There's not a lot of like, um, published like officially peer-reviewed papers. Um, so this is kind of the issue we were facing with this problem. And we realized that there was a gap of studies comparing all of these different techniques leading to a need for further ablation studies. Ablation being, you know, what's the effect of adding this to my model or removing this from my model? And there are a variety of choices that you can make um, when building these data-driven weather forecasting models. Uh, whether that be the base architecture, you know, do I use vision transformer, graph neural networks, et cetera? Do I make artificial or not ar architectural modifications like the Fourier neural operator that we saw in ForecastNet, um, which has been further advanced by NVIDIA in recent years, and also a variety of training techniques to, um, you know, further refine the model specifically for the task of forecasting, whether that be stabilizing the forecast over longer forecast lengths or um, yeah, a lot of techniques. I won't go into too much detail about all these, but uh, there was one initial study that compared a number of these, uh, which was done by UCLA, CMU, and Argonne National Lab, um, in which they compare some of these, but generally at a coarser resolution of prediction. So predicting at about 1.4 degree resolution, whereas like forecast net and a lot of the other um, more recent methods predicting up to quarter degree, which is a pretty significant difference in resolution. So the, the goal of this project was really two research objectives. The first was to showcase an off-the-shelf model performance. So all the models that I showed in the previous slides 
um, have a lot of customizations done to them that are specific for weather forecasting. Um, they're not just like off the shelf vision, computer vision models. And we wanted to see um, how well that did. And it actually did kind of remarkably well. So we used the SWIN V2 transformer. Um, we parameterized it for a moderate compute budget so we could train one of these models at quarter degree resolution on Perlmutter um, in less than a day and on 16 nodes that is. And we could showcase superior performance relative to the ECMWF's integrated forecast system, which is a you know a huge uh, weather forecasting benchmark to compare to. And the second research objective is, as I was talking about before, is to perform these evaluations of techniques from recently published literature, um, whether that be from the Google Graphcast model or from the Stormer model from UCLA. And we wanted, to, and because we have this. Um, you know, great scientific computing center behind us. We were able to like scale this to large scale, high resolution data at era five, era five, you know, a lot of times Appalachian studies, things like hyperparameter optimization, these can be very computationally intensive processes, especially um, in the weather forecasting world where you're, you know, literally modeling the entire earth. So our baseline model is the SWIN V2 transformer. Um, the main, it's, very pretty similar to a, the standard vision transformer with the main idea being adding a shifting window partitioning scheme for computing self-attention, which um, I won't go into too much detail, but basically it makes it a lot more efficient to calculate attention. And as such, it's able to be scaled to high resolution in ways that the original vanilla vision transformer is unable to. Um, and the data set we used for this was the ERA-5 reanalysis, which I was talking about. We take data from 1979 to 2018. Uh, we train our model using data from 1979 to 2015, and we validate it on 2016 and 2017, and do our out of sample testing of the SWIN transformer on 2018. I should mention this is all like um, auto regressive prediction. So, like, given a grid of the the Earth's weather, uh, can we predict like the next time step out of all those weather variables that we're predicting? So this is at quarter degree resolution, six hour time steps, regraded to a 2D field of shape 721 by 1440. So it's essentially um, kind of predicting the progression of an image. If you're, forget, if you're familiar with computer vision, like we have 73 weather channels for each of these grid points um, and we're trying to predict the next time step and how that evolves through time. And this, um, all this data is stored on scratch. It takes up about 20 terabytes and we store it in HDF5 files for fast performance. A little more of the computing details. Uh, we build this all in PyTorch shifter containers built by the machine learning engineers here at NERSC. Um, we train on 40, uh, 64 GPUs at a time using data parallelism. Um, and this gives trading times of less than a day. We also take advantage of the NVIDIA data loader library, um, which is an open source library that essentially moves a lot of, er, it makes it, it gives you the capability to move a lot of your data pre-processing to the GPU as opposed to the CPU, um, which leads to better efficiency for trading neural networks with the overlapped IO and compute going on. And we also do our experiment tracking and visualization and hyperparameter comparisons with the weights and biases framework, uh, which is also introduced to me by the machine learning engineers at NERSC. And for scoring our models, um, we use another library from NVIDIA uh, called the Earth2 Model Intercomparison Project. So this allows us to um, kind of standardize our scoring. And we essentially just predict across 2018 over 11 different um, initialization times in which we roll out a seven day weather forecast at six hour intervals. So that's uh, you know, 28 time steps or so. So the first thing we wanted to add to the SWIN transformer to see uh, the effect was the Google GraphCast sort of inspired channel weighting um, plus the addition of invariance. So I mentioned those 73 weather variables that we're predicting. Um, they add additional two kind of static inputs, which don't really evolve through time. The first being orography, which basically is um, including awareness of mountains and elevation. And the second being awareness of uh, land sea mask if you're on land or if you're on sea. And they also choose to weight their variables such that they prioritize weather variables closer to the surface. 
And this was also seen in that UCLA paper. Um, I'm not sure exactly sure of the meteorological reason why, but maybe those variables are more dynamic or more important. So the results for this, if our baseline is blue and our additional channel weighting and invariance is orange and x-axis here is uh, forecast time, like how, fat, how far into time are we forecasting with the weather um, and why is the RMSE or here it's the ACC, which is another metric for accuracy that you want to be closer to one. And we do see that channel weighting to be pretty effective in, in four major weather variables, uh, 500 hectopascal G potential height, um, which is very important for meteorologists and also kind of the more intuitive ones like two meter temperature, uh, 10 meter northward wind, 10 meter easter eastward wind. Um, so yeah, this is this is a bit of a success story. And so this works. And most of the benefit we saw in the 500 hectopascal G potential height. And the second thing we tried was um, something initial, initially developed, I think, by ForecastNet, um, which is the concept of multi-step fine-tuning, where it kind of seeks to address a problem with autoregressive models. As you progress through time, error can accumulate. Um, this is seen in many different many disciplines that do time series modeling or autoregressive modeling. And so this essentially divides our neural network training into two steps. The first being training on one time step in the future, so that's six hours into the future, and the second being rolling that model out again. You know, taking what it output at six hours and then outputting again at twelve hours out. Um, so also including that in the training, the accuracy on that um, that would be. So if I just did those two, it'd be two step fine tuning. I think Google takes this out to like twelve steps. Um, we tried both. Orange here, uh, four-step fine-tuning, and then in green, an eight-step fine-tuning model. Um, again, forecasting up to eight days. And we do find that this uh, longer rollout of forecasting um, in the training and co loss calculation uh, to be significantly beneficial, at least for um, these key weather variables, um, significantly you know, stabilizing that error in in uh, increasing over time. Um, across these three key weather variables. I didn't include eastward wind, but the, it's was pretty similar to northward wind. Um, but there are some issues with multi-step fine tuning, uh, especially in recently published literature, is that a lot of times the, the further out that you do multi-step fine tuning, it can cause increased blurriness because you're optimizing for that kind of average behavior over time. So you lose a lot of that like fine scale detail and information, which is important for regional and local weather patterns. Um, and this is, is also especially problematic um, in creating ensembles of models for prediction. So not just in machine learning, but in uh, numerical weather prediction, you know, it's a lot of ensemble prediction and, you know, creating dispersion among the ensemble is very important. Um, so our colleagues at NVIDIA have recently published a paper on this, uh, which includes, it's not on just this, but um, they include issues of why this is problematic. So we wanted to see, do we see this blurriness also in our SWIN models at quarter degree resolution? And one way to kind of mathematically represent blurriness in an image is to look at the power spectra. Uh, so if we look at the wind field, again, U10M is uh, one of the wind fields at 10 meters. And if we look at the red, our prediction versus the black, the Arrow 5 reanalysis data, we do see like that finer scale detail. You tend to lose it at higher wave numbers, which is um, indicative of finer scale detail. And then as we do four step fine tuning, eight step fine tuning, um, you know, that, that definitely gets worse. There's even some strange behavior that happens. But if even if you look at the images, you do see a lot of uh, blurriness associated with these, even though they do improve performance at forecasting longer time scales. So we also had a number of unsuccessful ablations. Um, the first being we tried a weather specific embedding layer for this wind transformer. So this um, essentially replaces the standard patch embedding you would do when building a vision transformer with a kind of customization, which uh, creates variable tokenization layer along with a variable aggregation layer using cross attention. So I won't go into too much detail about this, uh, but it was a really, heavy computational expense uh, for really not 
much performance improvement at all. Um, so when scaling this, so this is this uh, method was originally demonstrated on course of resolution prediction, but at high resolution, it's pretty computationally infeasible, uh, mostly because this aggregation has to be done sequentially due because these high memory pressures from cross attention, even using the 80 gigabyte A100s. So this is a pretty unsuccessful. And then on, another one we tried was the uncertainty-based multitask loss function. Um, so this is from that Feng Wu model from Shanghai Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. And they essentially define the model to predict two things. So not only am I predicting like what I believe to be the most likely value of a weather variable, I'm also predicting the standard deviation or uncertainty variance of that variable. So we're essentially predicting a distribution now um, and changing our loss function from mean squared error to negative log likelihood. Um, so the idea of this is like, you know, Google defines their own channel weighting for different weather variables. And this, the idea of this was to like, you know, what if we have the model learn that based off of how it's perceives different variables to be uncertain, like we can weight variables according to, according to how uncertain the model is about them, for example, as is often done in multitask machine learning frameworks where we're optimizing for multiple things or multiple tasks. Uh, but we actually found that this kind of consistently decreased performance along with um, slowing down model training, not as much as the previous evolution did, but um, also included increased blurring. And we even tried, you know, bigger, more complex models and the problem continued. So this was a, another unsuccessful one. So lastly, uh, comparing the best models that we ended up building with the integrated forecast system from the ECMWF, a pretty important weather benchmark. Um, if we look at uh, the blue model, which was, we kind of did the biggest model we could fit on the 80 gigabyte um, A100s, uh, taking advantage of techniques from PyTorch, like activation checkpointing, which allows you to fit an even bigger model than you would otherwise be able to fit. And then also, kind of that eight step fine tuning model, which I was talking about before, but um, keeping the size the same. And we compare that with IFS. Um, in general, the the big model, I'll call, this, I'll call this a big model, the blue one, the big model does uh, better than IFS at like shorter lead times, like less than two days forecasting out. Uh, but when generally for the, those longer forecasts up to seven days out, uh, the eight step fine tuning was pretty valuable. So this kind of, yeah, those are the, the main takeaways. And so there's a still it's an ongoing issue of, you know, this is helpful for longer rollout, uh, longer forecast times, but, you know, how do we deal with this blurriness? And this is kind of a ongoing problem. Uh, I presented this work at the American Meteor Meteorological Society annual meeting a couple of weeks ago, and there were a lot of talks like trying to address this blurriness problem. Uh, so in conclusion, these off-the-shelf models do very well. And we 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 show that with the Swin V2 transformer, you know, training on you know less than one percent of Perlmutter for less than a day, uh, we're able to surpass this IFS performance. Which, you know, if you're familiar with numerical weather prediction with the physics-based model, you know, these are on the order of like ten thousand more uh, computational resources than what we're using. So this is partially why these models are being so successful. And it's it's great to see that that continues with this Win V2 transformer. And of the evaluations we tested, we found that the channel weighting from the Google model was pretty effective for single step prediction and the uncertainty loss and variable aggregation strategies uh, were not good, didn't scale well to high resolution. And again, we see this trade-off of multi-step fine tuning help in, helping roll out RMSE, but also still exhibiting that blurry field. Thank you. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Any questions in the room? So I had one about your, you, you showed the couple different models, right? And that they had different, uh, you know, one was better at, at like those shorter lead times, one was better at those longer lead times. Mm -hmm. Do you think that it would be, would make sense to use like different models depending on the, you know, what you're trying to predict? If you're trying to predict out longer, you use one different model versus a, a model that's tuned maybe for, for shorter prediction times? 
Yeah, that's a really good point. And also related to kind of the kind of the two aspects of this project, which are like, can we forecast weather? And the other goal being like, can we forecast climate? You know, is that like going years into the future? So that's it's kind of this similar problem of like, you know, do we build the same models? And there's definitely like considerations that you need to make to have it stable for like climate rollouts, which I think hold true for um, at different lead times as well. But I think, yeah, you could definitely um, train multiple mo models for um, different lead times as well. Great. Any other questions? Well, let's thank our speaker again.